take your Bible and turn, please, to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. All right, let's stand, please, for the reading of God's Word, beginning with verse 19. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, rememberest that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Thank you very much. You may be seated. There are some that would have you believe that the story that we have read tonight is a parable. And most of the time, those who do that have an ulterior motive of doing away with the reality of hell. Now, there are several reasons why I do not believe this is a parable. The obvious reason is that in any parable that Jesus ever told, He never gave proper nouns. In this story, you have Moses, you have Lazarus, you have Abraham. But let's concede for the sake of argument that this is a parable. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. A parable is an object of a real thing. All right, if this is a parable, and I don't believe it is, then it still doesn't do away with the reality of hell because it is simply a picture of something that is real. Now, there are two things that you must keep in mind when you come to this story. Number one, who was it that told the story? It was none other than Jesus Christ. Are you aware that for every one time that Jesus described heaven, He described hell at least ten times? Do you know that in the New Testament there are 262 chapters, no less than 230 chapters teach the doctrine of eternal punishment? So it was Jesus that told this story. Perhaps the hottest sermon that ever fell from the lips of any man came from the lips of Jesus Christ. In Mark 9, 43 through 48, He said, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter in life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and where the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter life whole than having two feet to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and where the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. For it is better for thee to enter the kingdom of God, having one eye, 
than to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and where the fire is not quenched. So it was Jesus that told this story. The second thing you must bear in mind is this. To whom was the story spoken? Now, I don't believe that you can have a proper understanding of this passage without a key that unlocks the door. And you know what that key is? Verse 15. I want to ask you, how many times have you heard this story preached and related verse 15 to it, but I do not believe you can have a proper understanding without verse 15. Notice, please. And He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts. That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. All right, so get it. He is talking to people who justified themselves before men. Religious people. And he goes on to relate a story to them about a man who justified himself before men, a religious man, if you please. Here is an interesting thing about the pattern of Jesus' preaching. Whenever Jesus preached to the down and outer, He did not primarily preach about hell, but He preached about love. Did you know that? For instance, do you remember He came to the town of Jericho? Here was the most hated man in all of town. Let me remind you that publicans were hated people. But Zacchaeus was not a publican. He was the chief among the publicans. So that tells me he was doubly hated over anybody in town. But Jesus did not preach hell to Zacchaeus that day. In Luke 19 and verse 5 it says, And when Jesus came to the place, He looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And that day Zacchaeus was saved because he found somebody who loved him. You remember John chapter 4, a woman came to the well at midday to draw water. Now let me remind you of something. Women normally did not come at midday to draw water. They would usually come early in the morning or late at night. Why? Because at midday they were busy taking care of their household chores. It is my contention that this woman came at midday to seek a man. She had been married five times. She was living in adultery with a man that was not her husband. But may I remind you that Jesus did not preach hell to this scarlet woman. He preached love. In John 4, 13 and 14, He said, "...whosoever drink this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drink the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life." And that day the town harlot drank at the springs of living water because she found somebody who loved her. You remember John chapter 8? Here was a woman taken in the very act of adultery. Now, adultery demanded stoning. And so the Bible says that Jesus reached over and He wrote something in the sand. We're not told what He wrote. But do you remember another incident in the Bible where the finger of God wrote something? The Ten Commandments. And it very well could be that Jesus just wrote the Ten Commandments in the sand. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Whatever He wrote in the sand convicted them in their heart. And He said to the woman in John 8, 10 and 11, Does any man accuse you? She said, No man, Lord. He said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And that day the scarlet woman was made pure because she found somebody who loved her. Now listen carefully. On the other hand, when Jesus Christ preached to the religious crowd, He did not preach about love to that crowd, but He preached about hell and He preached it very warmly. For instance, in Matthew chapter 23, seven times he scathed upon the national council of churches of his day. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Why did sepulchres full of dead men's bones? Matthew twenty three fifteen. Ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Strong preaching, isn't it? Matthew twenty three thirty three. He said, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So, ladies and gentlemen. I try to follow that pattern of preaching in my own ministry. Whenever I go to a jail on occasion and preach to men behind bars, I don't spend a long time telling them they're on their way to hell. They know that. I don't spend a long time telling them they're sinners. Those bars they're standing behind tell them they're sinners. Now, I mention that. But the burden of my message is that somebody took their hell on Calvary's cross. And because He loved them, they don't have to go to hell. On the other hand, when I preach to people who think they're going to get to heaven by going through the baptistry, or by partaking of the seven sacraments, or being sprinkled as a baby, I preach on hell and I preach it very warmly. Now, let's go to our text, please. The word that is translated hell in verse 23 is the word Hades. Now listen carefully. Hades and the lake of fire are not the same. Now they're alike in many ways, but they're not the same. Let me differentiate. When a person dies today and he goes to hell... uh, Everybody suffers alike in Hades. There is no distinction of the punishment in Hades. However, Revelation 20 and verse 12, one day all of those who are in Hades will be bodily resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment. Now, it is already a foregone conclusion that everyone who is judged at the great white throne will be cast into the lake of fire. You say, then why are they standing there? They are standing there to receive their degree of punishment in the lake of fire. Psalm 62 and verse 12, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou rendest to every man according to his deeds. Jeremiah 17 and verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give every man according to his ways. And according to the fruit of his doings, Romans 2 and verse 6, who shall render to every man according to his deeds, Romans 2 and verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men according to my gospel by Jesus Christ. So in summary, when a person dies today without Christ, he goes to Hades. Everybody suffers alike in Hades. But one day all of those who are in Hades will be resurrected to stand before the great white throne judgment. At that time, they receive their degree of punishment in the lake of fire. Although Hades and the lake of fire are not the same, they are alike in many ways. I want to point out four things tonight about this word that is translated hell. Number one, hell is a place for sinners. Now, I want you to notice verses 19 through 21. Can you give me one moral indictment that is given against this rich man? Does it say he was a drunkard? No, sir. Does it say he was a drug addict? No, sir. Does it say he was a blasphemer? No, sir. You say, well, I found something wrong with him. The poor man lay at his gate full of sores, and all the rich man gave him was crumbs to eat. All right, let me draw something to your attention. The word for gate means a place of artistry or beauty. The word sores means, excuse me, pus-filled sores. So, here's what I believe this man thought. There is nobody that will let me mess up their landscaping and lie at their beautiful gate with these kind of sores 
but I know one man that will. Hey, there is nobody in town that will give me something to eat, but I know one man that will. Now, how many of you have seen the film, The Burning Hell? Would you raise your hand, please? Several of you have. And it's good in many aspects, but I think it misses a very strategic point. You see, that film pictures this man, a drunkard, a reprobate, a blasphemer. You don't find that in the context. You see, I think everything in the context is to the commendation and not to the condemnation of this rich man. Now, remember, folks, we're talking about a man who justified himself before men. You say, well, Brother Comfort, if he was such a good man, why did he die and go to hell? The only reason anybody ever dies and goes to hell. He simply rejected God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.18, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned when? Already. My dear unsaved friend, you're not going to be condemned when you go to hell. You are condemned as you sit in your seat. John 3 and verse 36, He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life. Get it! But the wrath of God, present tense, abides on him. The wrath of God swings over the head of an unsaved person like a pendulum, and that wrath of God is ready to devour that unsaved person at any time. In Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, he said this, God is under no obligation to keep the sinner out of hell one second. I thought about that, Brother Harper, and the more I thought about that, the more that burned into my heart. For 15 years of my life, I shook my fist in the face of God. I said, God, hands off of my life. You're not going to tell me how to live. And every breath I breathed was the grace of God. Let me say, my dear unsaved friend, God holds the last breath of your life in His hands. He can snuff it out any time He sees fit. Now, here to me is the sad thing. Here is a moral, upright man in hell tonight with the rogues gallery of sinners of all the ages. Do you know that God gives us what the phone book in hell is going to be like? I call Revelation 21 and verse 8 the phone book in hell. Notice, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone This is the second death. Now, God gives you eight classifications of people listed. Who's the first one? The fearful. You know who that is? That's a teenager who lives under the domination of the peer group. Afraid to get saved, afraid he's going to get laughed at by the peer group. That's a barrel-chested, beer-drinking man who's afraid to get saved. He's afraid his buddies will say, Here comes Mr. Old-Time Religion. The most prevalent reason why a person dies and goes to hell. P-R-I-D-E. And I'll tell you, maybe there is somebody in this audience tonight, you're afraid to come forward. What will people think of me? My pastor thinks I'm saved. I was the best, uh, the finest Christian in the youth group. What will they think of me? The most prevalent reason people die and go to hell is pride. All right, what's the second one listed? The unbeliever. You know who that is? That's a person who goes to Ambassador Baptist College, but he dies without Christ. That's a person who's the golden rule keeper, uh, the Ten Commandment keeper, but he dies without Jesus Christ. That's a Methodist Sunday school teacher who dies without Jesus Christ. All right, who's his next-door neighbor? The abominable question. How many of you remember the name John Wayne Gacy? Would you raise your hand? All right, many of you do. Many of you are too young to remember that. 
About 25 years ago, the most abominable thing that has been done in my lifetime happened in Chicago, Illinois. John Wayne Gacy sodomized and murdered 33 young men and buried them under his garage floor. I want to ask you a question. Would you move into a community knowing John Wayne Gacy is your next door neighbor? But here's the moral unbeliever right next door is the Sodom Hussein's. The Adolf Hitler's. The John Wayne Gacy's. You go down the block a ways and there's the uh, sorcerer. You know who that is? That's the same Greek word from which we get the word pharmacy, pharmakia, drugs. So here's a moral unbeliever, here's the John Wayne Gacy's, and down the block is a man who's on a bad LSD trip. Down the block is a person who is screaming for a fix of heroin, and right in the midst of the rogues gallery of sinners is a moral unbeliever. Now folks, you don't want to go there. Somebody said, well, a person will be different when they go to hell than they are in life. Do you believe that? Revelation 22, 11, let him that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Let him that is filthy, let him be filthy still. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that hell is a place of unbridled passions and unfulfilled desires. And I believe that as a person is in life, so he is in hell. Have you ever seen a person suffering from DTs, delirium tremens? Can you imagine a person dying and going to hell and their entire body convulsing and craving a drop of liquor, but they'll never get it? I believe that the harlot will still have a harlot's heart in hell. She'll try to sell the lust of her flesh, but nobody will be able to die it. Uh, to buy it. I believe that if you and I went down the halls of hell tonight, we would see Pontius Pilate trying to wash the blood of Jesus Christ from his hands. And for all eternity, he'll be washing. I believe if you and I could go down the halls of hell tonight, we would see Judas Iscariot with his 30 pieces of silver fiendishly screaming, I betrayed innocent blood. I betrayed innocent blood. If you and I could go down the halls of hell, I believe we would see Queen Jezebel with the blood of Naboth dripping from her hands, screaming, I killed him! I killed him. Hell is a place of unbridled passions and unfulfilled desires. All right, number two. Number one, hell is a place for sinners. Will you notice, please, number two? Hell is a place of suffering. Will you notice, please, verse 23. It says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Verse 24, the latter part of the verse. For I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25, the latter part of the verse. Lest they... But thou art tormented. Go down, please, to verse 28 lest they come into this place of torment. You know what that word means? A place of severe pain or continuous torture. Think of that. You know, I wish I could get up here tonight, young people, and preach like our seven-day Adventist friends preach, that one day hell is going to burn up and it's going to cease to be. How I wish I could preach that. But Jesus did not say that. Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall He say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew twenty five forty six. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Revelation 14, 10, 11, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. 
The phrase forever and ever is a very interesting phrase. Uh, it is used 20 times in the New Testament. Let me say you can prove the eternality of hell solely on the basis of the phrase forever and ever. Listen carefully. Sixteen times when the phrase is used, it describes the eternality of God. Whenever I think of God, I like to think of God as a circle. Where does the circle begin? It has no beginning. Where does the circle end? It has no ending. That's God. Micah 5 and verse 2. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Psalm 90 and verse 2, Before the mountains are brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, get it, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So 16 times it describes the eternality of God. All right, three times it describes the eternality of hell. Mr. Jehovah's Witness, you tell me hell is not forever and ever? Logically, you have to tell me neither is God. Because the same phrase describes both. All right, 16 times it describes the eternality of God. Three times the eternality of hell. Only one time does it describe the eternality of heaven. You, like I, have gone to a funeral. And everybody was aware that the body in the casket was the body of a man who was a reprobate, a God-hater. But what did that liberal preacher do? He preached that reprobate in the gates of God. And he went around talking about the beauties of heaven, and in the same breath he denied the existence of hell. Excuse me. That is not being intellectual, that is being an ignoramus. Now, when I was in college, I had a course in philosophy. By the way, thank God we don't have courses in philosophy here. Uh, we called it philosophy. It was the biggest bore and waste of time in my entire college career. But you know, I learned something in philosophy class. Listen carefully. Every philosopher realized this. Every thesis is contradicted by an antithesis. All right, what does that mean? That means everything has its opposite. In other words, there can be no north without a south. There can be no east without a west. There can be no right without a wrong. There can be no black without a white. Everything has its opposite. My dear friend, if there is no hell, then there is no heaven. If there is a heaven... That necessitates there must be a hell. I hear people say, well, even if there's no heaven to gain, I'm still glad I'm saved. Paul didn't say that. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, For if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Paul said, if there's no heaven to gain, we're the biggest fools on the face of God's earth. But my friend, there is a heaven to gain, and that necessitates there must be a hell to shun. Now, you know what I think God has done in this passage? He has taken the minute details of this story and He has pointed out the terribleness of the suffering in hell. Now, I want you to notice something with me. Every sense that this man has in life, he's got it in hell. Every sense. I read a book by a godly man, I am Haldeman, over 300 pages in that book, and I agreed with everything he said in that book except one thing. He said when a person dies and goes to hell, he is a disembodied spirit. His spirit suffers, but not his body. Do you believe that? Let me remind you, Mark 9, 43 through 48, two hands in hell, two feet in hell, two eyes in hell. Matthew 10 and verse 28, And fear not him which is able to kill the body, but not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want you to notice every sense he has in life, he's got in hell. All right, notice please verse 23. It says, And in hell he left up his eyes. There's a sense of sight. Being in torments, he's got the sense of feeling. 
and he seeth there as his eyes again. Verse 24, and he cried, he's got emotion. And he said, he's got the sense of speech. A latter part of the verse, cool my tongue. He's got the sense of taste. For I am tormented. There's a sense of feeling again. Verse 25, Abraham said, he's got the sense of hearing. Every sense he has in life, he has it in hell. You say, now, wait a minute. This is not the lake of fire. This is Hades. His body is in the ground awaiting the resurrection. How in the world can he have a physical body in Hades when his body is in the ground awaiting the resurrection? Now, I don't know all the answers, but I do believe this. There is never a time when our spirits are not clothed upon by some type of a body. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, For we know that if our earthly tabernacle of this house were dissolved, get it, we have, present tense, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So I believe that there is an intermediary body awaiting the resurrection. Do you remember when Peter, James, and John went up to the Mount of Transfiguration? Question, who did they see on the Mount? Moses? And Elijah. You say, I know why Elijah went to heaven without dying. Yes. But what about Moses? See, Moses died on Mount Nebo, and God buried him, and yet on the mount, before he was resurrected, he had a recognizable body. You know what I believe God has done in this story? I believe He has taken the minute details of this story and pointed out the terribleness of the suffering in hell. Now, get it. In life, this man was clothed in purple and fine linen. You know what we're told about that? A robe of purple and fine linen was worth six times its weight in gold. Six times its weight in gold. You know what that tells me about this man? He was a multimillionaire. Hey, he rode the finest chariots of his day. He wore the finest robes of his day. He was weighted on hand and foot. All right, the scene changes and he dies and goes to hell. Now, when he dies and goes to hell, what does he ask for? Does he ask for his servants? No. Does he ask for his palace? No. I used to say he asked for a drop of water. A whole lot less than that, folks. If you put your finger in water tonight and you pull it back, you're going to come back with a whole lot less than a drop of water. And here is an interesting thing. There is a multi-millionaire in hell this very moment screaming for an infinitesimal amount of water. And he'll never get it. Zechariah 9.11 says there is no water in the pit. Now, I don't know what the resurrection body will entail. I have, uh, excuse me, I don't know what this intermediary body will entail. It may be something like this. Years ago, I was in Colorado for a meeting. And the pastor said, Brother Comfort, there's a man in my church yesterday that had his arm cut off. Would you go with me to the hospital to see the man? So he and I stood in that hospital room, and I looked at that bloody nub. And the longer I looked at that bloody nub, the sicker I became. Now, I'm sorry, but I have a weak stomach. I know you say I'm a wimp, but I have a weak stomach. And I knew that if I did not leave that room, something bad was going to happen. I knew I had to leave the room. So, before I left the room, the man looked at me and he said, Preacher, you know the worst thing about this mishap? It's not that I lost my arm. But the worst thing about it is, my arm keeps itching me. And he says, I reach over there to scratch it. But it's just not there. He said, it is about to drive me out of my mind. In 1974, I was in a meeting in Davidson Memorial Baptist Church on Route 74 here in Shelby, long before I ever thought about Ambassador Baptist College. I stood in a man's house who had had his leg amputated six months before. And he said, Preacher, you're going to think this is stupid. He said, You see that leg I had amputated six months ago? He said, The calf of that leg is cramped. And he said, I reached down there to soothe the cramped muscle, but it's just not there. He said, it is about to drive me out of my mind. 
I preached this in Indianapolis. A nurse came to me and she said, Brother Comfort, what you have preached is valid. She said, whenever we have an amputation in the hospital, that amputee has some type of a burning, itching, or a cramping sensation in that amputated limb. She said, you know what we put on the bottom of their chart? Phantom pains. Phantom pains. Can you imagine dying and going to hell and reaching over to soothe your tormented body? But it's just not there. Number one, hell is a place for sinners. Number two, hell is a place of suffering. Will you notice, please, verse 24, hell is a place of sorrow. Verse 24, it says, And he cried and said, A place of sorrow. Matthew thirteen forty one and 42, The Son of Man shall send forth His servants, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all that offend in them which do iniquity, get it, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, where there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Many years ago when I was a college student, my brother and I went to see my mother in Creedmoor Hospital on Long Island. My mother spent 35 to 40 years in mental institutions all over New York and Pennsylvania. And so as my brother and I walked down the halls of this mental institution, we heard the weirdest screams and cries that I've ever heard in my life. These screams and cries pierced through my body like an arrow. I couldn't wait to get out of that place. When we got out of that place, I looked at my brother and I said, Billy, I believe that God has given us a minute picture of what hell must be like. Can you imagine going to a place where the screams of the damned ascend from the sulfuric avenues of hell and they have no rest day nor night? A place of sorrow. I want to mention three reasons quickly why I believe there is sorrow in hell. Number one, will you notice please verse 25? Abraham said, Son, remember. Remember. You know, I think remembrance must be a terrible thing in hell. How do you think it would be for this man to be in hell tonight and remember his palace? To remember his upstanding a position in the community, to uh, remember his luxuries and his chariots and his servants, but all of those are absent in hell. Don't you think that would add to his torment in hell? Now notice what Abraham called him. He called him son. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that was a bolt from the blue. When Abraham addressed him as son... I believe that recalled to his mind every opportunity he had had to receive the Messiah. Do you realize here was an unsaved son of Abraham in hell? Why, it was under the Jews that the oracles of God were committed. John 1.11, He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. John 1.12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. And I believe that as he's in hell tonight, his memory rehearses all of those opportunities he had to receive the Messiah. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, but he very well may have sat on the shores of the Galilee when Jesus fed the 5,000. How do you think it would be to die and go to hell having heard the Son of God preach? Having seen the miracles fall from His hands? And in hell tonight, I believe, he says, can't I ever get away from those burning eyes and that thunderous voice? Can't I ever get away from the vision of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine a person dying and going to hell having sat in a meeting like this and in hell forever and ever hearing just as I am without one plea? But that thy blood was shed for me, and as thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And I believe the sinner in hell will say, stop the music. Stop the music. 
Won't that song ever quit playing? Memory must be a terrible thing in hell. How do you think it would be for the student of Ambassador Baptist College to die and go to hell? And see the vision of Richard Harper and Ron Comfort forever and ever and ever. Can I ever get away from those men? Can I ever get away from their preaching? Memory must be a terrible thing in hell. Number two, I believe there is sorrow in hell because of the influence we've had to take others with us. Remember Romans 14, 7 and 8, none of us live it to himself. And no man died to himself, whether we live, we are the Lord's. Whether we die, we are the Lord's. Whether therefore we live or die, we are the Lord's. Anybody who dies and goes to hell will influence somebody to die and go to hell with them. Now listen carefully. Somebody says, well, here's a soul in hell. Excuse me, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Pancho, I've heard missionaries preach. Here is a missionary-minded man in hell. Excuse me, I don't believe it. Was he a missionary-minded man in life? No. Was he a soul in her life? No. As a man is in life, so he is in hell. You say, all right, then tell me why he did not want his five brothers to go to hell. Here's my contention. I believe there were six boys in that family, of which he was the oldest. Parents, haven't you seen in your family how the oldest child sets the example for the other children? When my daughters were growing up, my middle daughter Becky always wanted to be like her older sister Rhonda. Rhonda was the apple of Becky's eyes. When Rhonda, when Becky was approaching her fourth birthday, Rhonda was already five. We came to Becky and we said, Becky, what do you want on your fourth birthday? She said, Daddy, I would like to be five years old like Rhonda. I would like to have long hair like Rhonda. And I would like to be Rhonda. Honestly, we would go into a restaurant to eat and the waitress would come and take the orders and Rhonda would order. She'd go to Becky and she'd say, and little lady, what would you like? And she'd say, anything my sister had, I'll take. If Rhonda had ordered a half a pound of raw hamburger... Becky would have said, if it's good enough for my sister, it's good enough for me. I believe there was a time that if Rhonda jumped off the roof of this auditorium, Becky would have said, Daddy, can I do it? Rhonda did it. And Becky wanted to do everything that Rhonda did. Here's my contention. I believe that this man knew that as he lived, so his five younger brothers were going to live. And as he died, so his five younger brothers were going to die. And he knew that when they got to hell, they were going to point to him throughout all eternity and say, Brother, it's your fault. Brother, it's your fault. Brother, it's your fault. You listen to me. The billion degree flames of hell will be nothing compared to a son or daughter pointing to a mom and dad and saying, Mama, it's your fault. Daddy, it's your fault. Sorrow in hell because it's a place, number three, of darkness. Second Peter 2 and verse 4 calls it chains of darkness. Second Peter 2, 17, it is mist of darkness. Jude verse 13, it is blackness of darkness. Matthew 8 and verse 12, it is outer darkness. Somebody says, how in the world could there be fire in hell and be a place of darkness? All right, listen, you ask any of the men over there at the volunteer fire department what they carry when they go into a home to put out a fire. And you know what they'll tell you? They take a flashlight. You see, in that house, there is fire, but it is a place of darkness. Hell is outer darkness, chains of darkness, mist of darkness, and blackness of darkness. In closing, number one, hell is a place for sinners. Number two, hell is a place of suffering. Number three, hell is a place of sorrow. And finally, hell is a place of separation. Notice, please, verse 26. Abraham says, And beside all this between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, 
so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Look this way. I wonder what this rich man would have said if Abraham would have looked over and he'd have said, Now, sir, if you're a good man in hell, I'm going to let you out in one million years for five minutes. And in that five minutes, I'm going to give you the biggest drink of water that you have ever had in your entire life. You know what I believe the rich man in hell would have said? Oh, oh, I've got to stay away from the harlots. I've got to stay away from the dirty Joe Kelling crowd. I can't be around that crowd because if I'm a good man in hell in one million years, I'm going to get out for five minutes. Abraham didn't say that to him. You know what he said? He said, son, you're in hell... And hell is a place of no repentance and no return. Have you ever thought about this? There are three things that are the same about heaven and hell. Number one, there's no exit. Number two, the inhabitants will be there forever. And number three, they last the same amount of time. Now in closing, I want you to think about three things from which the unsaved man is separated, number one, separated from the good things of life. You remember verse 26, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. No good things in hell. Uh, There are no chandeliers. There's no air conditioning. There are no Cadillacs in hell. All of the good things of hell are absent. No granddaddy will be able to take his grandson on his lap and hear that grandson say, Papa, I love you. No mother will be able to clutch that little baby to her bosom and feel the warm breath of that baby on her cheek and hear the laughter of that little baby in hell. All the good things of life are gone in hell. Number two, separation from our loved ones. I've heard people say this, well, if uh, my husband dies and goes to hell, I love him so much, I want to die and go to hell with him. That's a stupid thing to say. I believe that in hell every person is an isle unto himself. No concourse with those who are in hell. I want to ask you, how many of you have loved ones that are unsaved? Would you raise your hand, please? You know, I had a daddy that I loved with all my heart. And I mean this, I believe that I would have been willing to go to hell in my daddy's place. I remember about 40 years ago, I was preaching in Jacksonville, North Carolina. My wife was at home expecting a baby. And that night I had preached on the subject of compassion. I went to the motel after the service that night and I wrote my dad a tear-stained letter. I said, Dad, as I'm writing you right now, tears are streaming down my face. I said, I have shed thousands of tears over your soul. I have prayed thousands of prayers over your soul. And I cannot stand the thought of your dying and going to hell. I saw my dad the next summer. He had had three heart attacks. And all the vin vigor and vitality that I knew in my dad was gone. And I thought, the next time I see my dad, I may be standing over his casket to preach his funeral. What could I say about my dad knowing my daddy's body was in the casket, but his soul was in hell? What could I say about him? I came to my dad and I said, Dad, I love you so much. And I said, Dad, I see that you're failing and you don't have much time. He said, Son, you're right but he didn't get saved. The next summer I was at the Bill Rice Ranch getting ready to go to the tabernacle to speak. And somebody handed me my mail. In the mail was a letter from my stepmother. My stepmother was illiterate. She could not read nor write. Somebody else had to write the letter for her. And the letter read this, Dear Ronnie, your daddy has been taken to the hospital He's lost over 45 pounds. His larynx is swollen. He cannot swallow any food. He cannot hold down any food. We don't know why. We've got to find out why. I want to ask you a question. What would have been the first thing you would have thought of if the only thing you knew about your dad was drinking and carousing and smoking and living that kind of a lifestyle? What's the first thing that would have come to your mind? Oh, dear God. My daddy has lung cancer. And you have no idea how heavy my heart was when I went to the tabernacle that morning knowing before the closing amen was said, my daddy may be in hell. 
Young people, I prayed for my dad for 33 years. On June the 23rd, 1986, I was preaching in Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. On a Monday night, after my daddy heard me preach, he came down the aisle and he was born again. Don Smith knelt at the front row and led my dad to Christ. I could stand over my dad's casket in January of 1989. And I could say, folks, there's no question mark over my daddy's casket. Because on June the 23rd, 1986, after I prayed 33 years, my dad came down the aisle and he got saved. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever shed one tear over your unsaved loved one's soul? Have you ever fasted one meal because your loved one meant more to you than the food on your table? Number three. Number one, separation from the good things of life. Number two, separation from our loved ones. And worst of all, separation from God. Revelation 22 and verse 5 says that in heaven we'll have no need of the sun, moon, or stars because Jesus is the light in that new city. Do you know why, ladies and gentlemen, hell is outer darkness? Because the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not there. You can take the John Wayne Gacy's, the Sodom Zanes, the billion degree flames out of hell, it's still going to be hell. The worst thing about hell will be separated from God and His love forever and ever and ever. In the late 60s, as we lived in Clarksburg, West Virginia, I had just come back from the Bible lands, and there was a local church that had asked me if I would show my slides on the Bible lands on a Wednesday night. I thank God so many times that my wife and my family were not with me that night. My wife and my daughters went to our own local church to prayer meeting. So I fellowship with the preacher, and about 11 o'clock at night, I started home. Now in those days, ladies and gentlemen, I was diagnosed with an eye disease that could eventually cause blindness. I had 2,400 vision in both eyes. I am told that 2,200 vision is, is declared legal blindness. I had 2,400 vision in both eyes. And God has preserved my vision through two corneal transplants and three cataract procedures. But that night I stopped to pick Miss Rosenau's son, Roger, and bring him home with me. It had been raining all day long. And it did not even seem like the headlights penetrated the darkness. And to complicate matters, we came out of the city limits of Clarksburg to the denseness of the countryside. And all of a sudden, staggering in front of my car was a drunken man. Before I knew it, I hit him head on. He flew over the hood of my car and he landed under the wheels. The first thing I thought, This is a nightmare. It could not happen to me. And then I thought, somebody has played a trick on me. They've thrown an object in my pathway. So I stopped the car, and I got out, went around to the side, and there was a drunken man lying under the wheels of my car. His mouth was gaping, and his eyes were closed. I knew he did not have much time at best, so I got down on my knees close to his ear and I said, Sir, you don't have much time. You need to get ready to meet the Lord. And the nurse came to me and she said, Mr. Comfort, you don't have to talk to him. He's dead. He can't hear you. I never got a vision of hell so clearly as I got that night. Here was a man that had lived 20 years in a shack in the middle of nowhere. His wife had left him 20 years ago. My wife and I went to see him at the funeral home long after his body had been on display. Only two people had signed the guest register, his daughter and his son-in-law. As far as I know, his wife did not even come to his funeral. This man would go into town early in the morning, drink anything with alcohol in it. 
and stagger home late at night. The only thing he had on his person that night was a bottle of hair tonic that he had been drinking. And a, a sheriff came up to me and he saw that I was visibly shaken. And he said, Mr. Comfort, please, please. He said, don't blame yourself. He said, I've been called many evenings to come and pick up this man and take him home. And I knew that one night I would get the fatal phone call that the man was dead. He said, I'm not going to charge you with anything. He said, it wasn't your fault. But you listen to me. Nothing that sheriff could say that night could comfort my heart. And I looked at that man under the wheels of my car and I said, Dear God, I deserve to be where this man is right now. And I said, Dear God, I want every drop of blood in my body dedicated to keeping people out of the place where this man is tonight. I want to ask you, if you had been under the wheels of my car, where would your soul have gone? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. I would like for the instruments tonight to play almost persuaded now to believe. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let me ask you this. Now please listen carefully. Please listen carefully. If there is a doubt about your salvation, please do not raise your hand. If there is a doubt about your salvation, do not raise your hand. How many of you tonight can say, Brother Comfort, there is not the slightest doubt in my mind about my salvation? I remember a time and a place when I realized I was a lost, hell-deserving sinner that Jesus died on the cross, He rose again, He came into my life, He changed my life. And there is not the slightest doubt in my mind that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. I can give you a Bible reason for that. If you can honestly say that, slip up your hand, please. If there is a doubt, don't raise your hand. If there's a doubt, don't raise it. Thank you, you may put them down. I wonder, are there those tonight who say, Brother Comfort, I couldn't raise my hand. If I died right now, may I have the center mic, please? If I died right now, I don't know I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know it. I'd like to know it. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died on the cross and He rose again. I know I can't get to heaven without receiving Christ. And tonight, the best I know how, I'd like to receive Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior. Would you pray for me? Tonight, I'd like to make sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? Slip up your hand right now. Anywhere in the building. God bless you, young man. Thank you. Somebody else, pray for me along with this young man. I too would like to make sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I want to make sure. God bless you there, young man. You may put it down. Thank you. Two have raised their hands. Are there others? Pray for me, Brother Comfort. I'm not sure I'm saved. I want to make sure tonight include me in the prayer along with these two. Anybody else? All right, listen carefully. Many meetings. Brother Harper, as well as I, have people come to me and say, Brother Comfort, I made a profession. I really believe I was saved, but the devil has plagued my mind with doubts. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying if you doubt, you're not saved. I'm not saying that. But I am saying this, that you will never be any good to God if you doubt your salvation. I wonder tonight, are there those in the building who would say, Brother Comfort, I made a profession. I really believe I was saved. But the devil has plagued my mind with doubts. And I want to get the doubts gone. Tonight, I want to get the doubts gone. I made a profession. I really believe I was saved. But I want to get the doubts gone tonight. Would you pray for me? Slip up your hand right now. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Yes, anybody else? Tonight, I will God bless you on the aisle. I want to get the doubts gone over here on my right, way back there at the back. 
All right, I would like for the men and ladies who are personal workers to come right now, please. If you would come and stand. Every one of you who raised your hand, I want you to leave your seat right now. Those of you who said, I want to be saved or I want to get the doubts gone, I want you to leave your seat right now. And I want you to deal with that right now. All right? All of those who said, either I need to be saved or I need to get the doubts gone, you right now slip out of your place. God bless you. God bless you. I want every one of these dealt with. If they cannot give a clear-cut testimony, don't deal with them about assurance. Deal with them about salvation. God bless you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Amen. Father, I pray for these who are being dealt with right now. Now, Lord, I would pray that You'll give the personal workers wisdom. And I would pray that on August the 29th, 2006, that this will be sealed once and forever. I pray that these who have come forward tonight will never, never have to make that decision again. And I pray that when they leave this altar, the basis of their salvation will be the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I pray that will be totally what they're trusting. Now, Lord, many of us have loved ones that are on their way to hell. God, I pray that as a result of this service tonight, that there will be compassion that will be transferred to loved ones that will result in salvation.